Hello everybody, this is the consequences of climate change. And so now that we know that um, CO2 and greenhouse gases have generally been increasing on the planet, um, we need, know that the planet will be increasing in temperature. And what is that going to mean? So I spent some time thinking about um, the consequences of climate change. Now, everybody you know has probably heard in the news at one time or another that sea level is rising. What we're generally seeing at that rate is about three millimeters per year. Okay, so what does that mean in the next 90 to, you know, 100 years? What we expect by about 2100, we should see um, the, the ocean about a meter higher. So that's about three feet. So, you know, you might not think that three feet is that big of a deal. Uh, but, you know, that... that um, across the planet, that's a lot of ice if you're covering the planet in three feet more of water. Um, and this is a map of Florida of what three feet means. Um, that is, you know, most of Miami underwater. Um, the Florida Keys pretty much completely underwater. And all along the coast, we're going to have a lot of things underwater. Um, the Netherlands is a country that most of it is, be uh, a lot of it is below sea level and they have dikes holding back water uh, and pumps pumping out water. Um, there's some thought that, you know, the Netherlands, good portions of that country might not be able to exist anymore. The highest um, point in the Maldives is only 2.4 meters tall. So um, the, the Maldives are an island chain in the Indian Ocean. And, you know, that whole country might not be able to, to be there anymore. But I don't want to spend so much time about that. Most of us have heard about, you know, sea level increases. What I want to spend some time is thinking about other consequences. So, um, tropical disease migration. Uh, we're already starting to see this a little bit in, um, with malaria. Uh, malaria is a, a protease. It's a si single-celled little tiny organism that lives in um, the blood of mammals and the blood of birds and then gets transmitted via um, mosquitoes. And it's not necessarily that well, the, the increased temperatures allow the, the mosquito to get in different places. So if we look at a worldwide map of where we find malaria, this is where this, these are the countries that we find it, right? It's actually not, um, you know, all of that much found in, um, in like the drier parts of Mexico. But it's actually relatively close to getting into the U.S. And they think that with increasing temperature, malaria will spread out into the, the Caribbean islands and potentially get it relatively easily into southern Florida. Um, we're out seeing this with um, in Madagascar. Madagascar is a very mountainous country and the, the mosquito really needs warm temperatures but it's starting to be found um, at higher and higher elevations as temperature increases. But this is also going to think um, be a problem with other mosquito-borne illnesses like dengue fever and leishmaniasis in the future. Coral reefs, we're, um, if any of you ever ha like have a dream to go um, scuba diving, um, I would suggest go to it now, or if you haven't done it, you should get it now and go scuba diving as soon as possible because most coral reefs are going to be bleached and com pretty much completely gone from the planet by about 2050. That is the expectation. Uh, due to um, the ocean acidification. So as one of the one of the consequences of increasing CO2 is that the oceans get more acidic. Um, there's this complicated long process with the carbon cycle that I don't want to get into, but it may makes the oceans more acidic, which reduces the ability of coral to um, lay down its, its calcium skeleton. And when you combine that with the higher temperatures and uh, you really increase 
the, the probability of re coral reefs bleaching and also getting diseases that then can completely wipe out whole, um, whole coral reefs. Another example is the continued or the worst isolation of uh, mountaintop species. So imagine a, a type of species that only lives up here on the top of the mountain. As we get no, um, as we get more higher temperatures and the the surrounding landscape gets warmer what that means is each kind of one of these bands is kind of like pushed upward and that's okay because the desert grassland will just you know might take over the place where the oak grassland was but it's a big problem for the species that live in this mixed coniferous forest and can only be up there right if they get warm enough such that the pine forest would overtake that, all those species that were up here were going to be um, going away. And, you know, there's a lot of really cool species that live up there. Uh, bighorn sheep, um, mountain goats, this is a chamois, it's in the, the European mountains, um, marmots, and these are Hawaiian silver swords. All of these examples are organisms that are living at um, the top of these mountains and are adapted to living at the top of the mountains and can't really live anywhere else. Including one of, I think, the cutest animals in the world. This is a pika. Um, it's this little rodent that lives in the tundra and top of really tall mountains in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, might live in Asia too, I'm not I, I'm not sure. But um, some people do say that this is the inspiration for Pikachu. Uh, but um, I can kind of see it. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's completely true or not, but they uh, are these little rodents that run around gathering and um, create this little, um, like, a hay pile inside their little burrows that they eat over the really cold winters. And uh, we can also very much see that their populations have been crashing kind of all across the, the mountainous region. Um, another uh, impact that we might uh, expect is has to do with how the rivers are laid out in the United States. So uh, imagine a species of fish that lives here in the um, Arkansas River and the Red River. Okay, now let's say that they're below this red line is it's too hot, right? As we get closer to the equator, as we go south here, it gets hotter, right? So let's say the water it gets too hot for them below this red line. So what does that mean for the species that are in the, the Red River? Basically, they're stuck there, right? They can't swim here because it's too hot for them and they wouldn't be able to make it back up. So as the climate is warming, what we're going to expect is that this red line will shift up northward, completely eliminating the population that was in the Red River, but also the Arkansas River population now gets completely isolated. It can't make it over to the Colorado River here because this is a giant mountain range in between it, and it can't get out of the Arkansas River because it can't get go down into, you know, this red line. So we wouldn't expect some inbreeding uh, potentially in these populations and make it just continue to, um, as this red line will just only go up, uh, continue to limit their population. So it kind of, and what we see is this re is repeated. There's a lot of just the way that these rivers are oriented here in the U.S. There's the Cimarron River would be, you know, another river that w goes right in here. Uh, the Kansas River is a river that comes in right here. And all of these rivers would have a lot of the same impacts and continued stranding of species as that uh, red line starts to go up. Another consequence is that we would expect some plant pollinator mismatch. Now, um, um, let's imagine an example where we have bumblebees and daisies here. Now, plants oftentimes don't actually come out based on temperature. They, when the plants are coming out and blooming, is based on light. Okay, so a lot of plants won't come out, won't you know, start growing from seed or leaf out if they're a perennial plant 
until they know that there's going to be enough sun, right? So there's been some natural selection to come out on a certain date or, you know, within a couple days of a certain date. Um, and this is, you know, species dependent, but the thing is, that's unchanging, right? We always know that there'll be some amount of light, a specific amount of light on April 1st every year, on May 1st every year. Um, doesn't really, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter on the year. We're always, it's you know, the rotation of the Earth and the revolution of the Earth. It's not, um, you, you can't really change how much sunlight we're going to get. However, a lot of the pollinators for plants come out based on temperature. Their appearance of when they come out in the spring is determined by temperature. Okay, so what we generally see is how these populations would come out is the plants would come out a little bit early. The, the, the daisy pink being pink here and the pink, this is like, you know, a, how many individuals have, are blooming at this certain time. Um, so they you know they sense that there's enough light for them to grow and they we get a lot big numbers and then the bumblebees will also come out just a little bit after because they don't want to come out until they have some food that nectar in these flowers right so they're not going to be coming out until a little bit later but what's going to happen then in a warming scenario is that spring is going to come earlier as far as spring for temperature wise not for light so what we would expect is that those bumblebees are going to come out earlier and then what happens is this little all these bumblebees are start coming out and they're like all right where are the flowers at and they're not going to be available and there is going to be huge problems then with food sources for these bumblebees and we would expect their populations to decline and this is probably going to happen with a lot of plant pollinators especially ones that are have very specific specialized relationships between you know just one plant and one one species that can pollinate it um, and then this is also really important for hibernation. What we're seeing is bears are coming out of hibernation earlier, expecting berries to be around and food sources that, you know, are plant-based that will not come out. Uh, bats are the same way where uh, they're coming out of, they're warming up in their little caves, coming out of hibernation, expecting there to be a bunch of insects to eat, and they're just simply not there. So as much as we're going to have plant pollinator mismatches, we should see some hibernator and food mismatches also. So that's all for this lecture. See you later.